Welcome back. Nice walk in the sun. Nice and humid for a Riverland day. Exactly, that's what I thought you'd say. Uh, right, uh, we're doing a, we're going to do a panel session here. Questions, answers, your questions, they answer it. That's how this is going to work. The people who are up here, you've already met Ollie, Andy and Peter. We also have Ben, Brett and David. What I want to do is for Ben, Brett and David, just to give you a minute each to very quickly introduce yourself rather than me do it and get it wrong. Um, I'll let you guys do it. So uh, Ben, if you want to go first. Yeah, g'day everyone. My name's Ben Wibbler and I'm an Industry Development Officer with the ABA. Um, our primary role is really to represent the peak body at um, a grower level, state lef level, national and international level. Um, we do that by liaising with um, government bodies in our R&D programs, um, whether that be you know, on the ground here with the ag tech companies. Um, we have investment um, going with SARDI, um, Plant Health Australia, um, and our primary role really is to drag all that research back to the growers and try and get adoption on farm. So that's, I guess, a quick overview. Yeah, well done. I love it. Less than 60 seconds, that's the best. Uh, Brett, I'm going to do you next. So, yeah, microphone there from five minutes Test, down the road. Testing one, two, five. Right. Uh, I'm Brett Proud um, from Loxton North, so only a few minutes away. My family's been uh, farming here for very nearly 100 years. My grandfather was involved in the construction of the Humphrey Pump over at Cobb Dogler and when that was completed came over to Loxton North and helped construct the first two steam driven pumps on the river back in the early 1920s. So um, I did have a professional career for over 20 years and I've been back here on the, on the land on the farm for approximately 20 years now. Um, our family business is called Sherwood Estates and it actually has a quite a unique business structure. It does mirror Buller Borough. If you're familiar with Buller Borough, the Broadacre uh, operations here in the, river, uh, in the Riverland and Mallee. Uh, we now operate 200 hectares of vineyards on, on 10 vineyards just here. Um, and we've just gone through an internal restructure, which I won't go through all the nitty gritty details, but um, you know we have family all, all those assets being uh, operated by Sherwood Estates, the company, on behalf of all the you know family owners of the properties. So uh, that's been very, very successful. Um, I have just recently retired as the past chair of the Riverland Wine Grape Growers Association, which I had been for three previous years, and I've been on the Riverland Wine Grape Growers Association and Riverland Wine for the last 11 years. So, you know, I've sort of contributed, our business has contributed a significant amount to representing, you know, the farmers of the region. I was also a member of the Wine Grape Council in a number of roles for, you know, I don't know, five or six years. Um, so, again, I've sort of contributed at that level as well. Uh, that's, that's on the farm stuff. Um, a few years ago, PERSA invested a fair bit of money into a project called... Um, I forget establishing a model or uh, establishing a model for a cluster of premium grape growers in the Riverland, something like that. Anyway, that went through to the end, and the people involved in that actually didn't materialise into a cluster itself. But one of the other people involved uh, and me having very very similar family situations, so multiple brothers over 200 hectares, 6,000 tonnes. We thought, well. You know, so much of what we do is on the same page. So along with the, their independent chair, because believe it or not, that family is actually a collaborative farming venture as well, modelled off of ours. Uh, so we have a, a independent chair who's the same person and we also engage them to be the independent chair of River Wine Collaboration, which this year will be a 20,000 tonne wine and grape business. So. Uh, the two shareholding families and the nine other families sell all of their wine grapes to River Wine Collaboration, which then um, sits down and works out what we do. So we sell grapes as grape right through to making wine, etc. So, you know, if you talk about irrigation, our family's been here right from, you know, the construction of the uh, Humphrey pump um, and the steam-driven pumps, and we've been farming uh, 80 hectares now for nearly 100 years. So a fair bit of family history right here in the district and in irrigated agriculture. Well done cramming that much into two minutes. 100 oh. years worth into two minutes, well done. <laughs> we got the two minute bit. Yeah, that's all right, you've done well. I'll get you for that later on. And uh, David, your couple of uh, introduction, please. Yeah, um, I'm David Zadar, I grew up at Blanchetown, uh, wine grape grew up at Blanchetown. Um, 
similar to actually Brett, uh, my great grandfather settled there 1896 and put a steam pump in and flood irrigated all bef the property that's above the lot that before the lot was in. Um, so that's we've had land there since then. Uh, a lot of farming, been in grapes for um, 60 years, and um, yeah, it's probably probably about um, 20 or 17 years ago when we converted to drip from overhead irrigation. That's when I really started my automation ag tech journey. And I suppose a lot of those things have sort of come along the way a lot, sort of trying to get things that I couldn't get off the shelf. So we had to sort of get a few smart people along the way to help me out and get a few things. And now there's a lot of products out there that actually can do what I couldn't do then that I was able to do. So it's really exciting. It's good to be part of the Vidivisor um, as well. Um, finding that's really good. And yeah, just, uh, yeah. And, and things like this are always very good. Excellent. All right, cool. So they're the introductions out of the way. Uh, it's time for some questions. Now, when we wrapped up the last session with, uh, with Pete, I did cut Mark off and he wanted to make a comment there. So uh, to, to, make, uh, to make good on that, Mark, I know you just want to make a comment, but I'll, I'll let you go. My comment was simply that the, um, the precision irrigation down to maybe individual trees or at least small areas is being researched and developed it's pretty messy at the moment, but it's something that is um, on the cards. Where it'll go, who knows? Right. No worries, Mark. I did want to get that in because it was worthwhile uh, mentioning as well. Uh, Pete, do you want to talk to that, though? I mean, I know the question was uh, individual plants and irrigating them, and as Mark says, it's still a little bit messy, but is it, are, are we getting better at it? Like, are, are we making advances here? I would be the least knowledgeable person on that subject going at the moment. Well, um, Brett, do you want to jump in there then instead? Yeah, I can add a little bit. Um, with our operations, uh, for now over four years, we've used all the GPS, auto steer, digital mapping, whole box and dice on our 200 hectares. Um, part of that is actually digital mapping of our yield. So in essence, every metre of our property is, um, is filed away. and. And what we do is we actually use that data to then prescription spread our nutrients. So during the winter time now, in association with our agronomist, who will then work out a blend, we then go through the whole 660 kilometres where the rate that is distributed is dependent on the yield data. So as each year goes, we'll just use layer upon layer upon layer of that data to then determine what our prescription uh, spreading will be with nutrients. So in a way, we are doing it vine by vine. I'm not sure that it regulates that quickly because we actually do, the yield doesn't vary that much. But if I had a yield map of uh, 2020 and a yield map of 2021, it's just so incredibly obvious that the evenness of yield across the patches um, is so much better. So it's quite remarkable. Mm. Andy, I'll just see you want to jump in here. Yeah, really, perhaps an observation from somebody who is measuring stuff down at the per vine or per plant level uh, and what our clients are asking for us in terms of deliverables out of that. And so two things come to mind. One is for companies that are looking for robotic, robotics and automation, well, they actually do want to know the, the, the precise location of every single post because that matters in terms of where uh, an autonomous tractor is going to go as compared to somebody who's putting out a uh, variable rate uh, of, of mulching. Um, then you know five or ten meters is probably okay. Um, they don't they don't really need to go down to that per vine level. So it kind of comes back to this point earlier about it depends on the problem. Right. Any questions you might have? Yep. Down. Uh, Hans Loder from Penley Estate in Coonawarra. But the question, sort of in the context of I'm a 2021 20, Nuffield Scholar, looking into uh, data management for viticulturalists, and I sort of look at this uh, individual plant or unit. Uh, mapping, creating the digital infrastructure to actually manage the data. Do you think it's that will in itself lead to more growers asking for this prescription farming down to the individual vine or unit plant? And similarly, do you think there is just not the critical mass of growers who even realise that it's possible already, in my mind, um, to do that and therefore just not asking for that solution? Who'd like to have a crack at this one? Hands, yeah. I we probably talked a little bit about this last week and certainly Collabora Cultures talked a lot about this. Um, and I think the observation around that would be that 
it's a bit of both. Um, I think in our own mind, in terms of what we do or, or the tools we've developed, um, we've really only had that model for six months. So we haven't had an opportunity to go out fully to market yet and, and talk about the benefits of that type of approach. Um, so yeah, it's, it's probably a little bit of both. And then I, c I come back to my earlier observations around, um, well, what are you trying to fix? Um, if, if it's spray applications in a particular um, crop type, that's probably going to look a little bit different in viticulture to what it would do in orchards. Um, and, and so really trying to formulate through, well, what's, what's the solution to the problem? And where does that super precision come into play and where, where doesn't it? And I think that example of the guys who are coming out with uh, autonomous robots, well, it's super important. Um, you want to know you're not going to crash into something. <laughs> David? Uh, yeah, hands. I think from, from my perspective, being a single operator with another worker that works half a day a week, um, I know my vineyard, I've known it for 25 years, I know it pretty well. Um, recently I, I had um, Sarah's Imaging come and do some imaging after a frost we had and I know that I've got weak spots and I know where they are and I know that if I focus on just them, I'll increase my yield by 5%. So that's more macro, but then when I got the data back from the imaging, I'm going, maybe I underestimate it, maybe it's more like 15%, so I really actually should put some more urgency into focusing on those weak spots, which is purely just getting um, higher pressure or uh, putting extra valves in. I have all these things in the shed, I just haven't prioritised putting them in, but I can see that it's going to actually make an instant result to my yield if I put it in sooner rather than later to get extra pressure to the end of the drip line so I get the extra water there and get the extra yield. All things I've known, things I haven't thought were as important, but now I do, once I get that, then I could probably start to worry about that, mac that really micro level per vine. But at the moment, just some data, just to get you started to you know, focus on the big stuff, get on top, that makes a big financial impact, and then you can go to the other stuff. Oh, <clears throat> I think just building on it as well, the, I think we all know the sustainability waves hitting us pretty hard at the minute. And uh, it's a pretty certain reality that um, water prices will go up, fertiliser prices are already up, um, you know, growers are going to have to put things exactly where they need to be. Um, so it, I think it's more of a reality than a question just at the minute. But, you know, the curve of the, um, the early adopters and the innovators and that sort of thing, um, you know, I think that'll, that'll kick in pretty, pretty quickly. Brett, sorry. Yeah, my point was going to be, I think there's some other questions which lead on with that. And it comes back to and hopefully my blood pressure doesn't get too high, but I suppose my disappointment in this whole environment and context is that we've actually forgotten that the work that all the innovators are doing should be based on the problems that are identified in the co-design of the whole issue. I've, I was on Riverland Wine Management Committee for over 11 years, and I can't recall once any anybody coming to an industry representation body saying, um, what do you think of the problems that your industry faces that we need solutions for? So to then, in a way, be confronted by today where we have people trying to sell the solutions, I firmly believe we haven't invested any time in a genuine search for the problems. Now, I'm not undermining the technology. All I'm saying is that the, tech, the money invested into the research would have been better placed solving problems which were real. And if you then go to the extension and, or the adoption and extension of the technology, that will then become automatic if it's solving identified problems. So you don't actually have to go and sell the technology on the hope that you find a problem because you know that you will have solved a problem. So, you know, you're right about early adopters. I mean, you don't have to convince me about technology. I mean, I own a 200 hec well, half a 200 hectare vineyard and we've invested hundreds of thousands of dollars into technology. So I'm not anti-technology, but what scares me right at the moment with our business is that I'm staring at a rabbit warren of technology. So unless we get Vidivisor or some digital platform which can collect all the data, process it and then use use the data that comes out of that, um, why, why would my nephew, who's in essence our tech guy on the property, add to his 26 apps? 
I mean, having 36 apps means he's going to do less work and sit there and look at his phone. So unless we co coordinate the technology, we're just going to disappear down into a rabbit warren and I'm not sure that we're going to be any better off. Brett, I think you've touched on what um, Ollie, Andy and Peter were talking about this morning as well. Ollie, I think you covered this uh, as well. But before I ask Ollie to respond to what you've just said, um, what is the gap? Like, where are the gaps at the moment? Is there too much data? Is it wrong data? Is it not uh, being integrated properly? Maybe, David, you could comment on this as well after. Br Brett, I'll let you go. Yeah. I think there's two gaps. One, the lack of co-design right from day one, right? I've, so the analogy is here we've got a lot of people going around putting really flash things on the roof of the building. Unfortunately, we don't have good walls and foundations to the building. So the stakeholders, the growers, those that contribute taxes, levies, contributions, etc., need to be shown the respect for the contribution to the industry and so their needs are met. So actually having a good co-design effort, and you've got to invest time and effort in it. It doesn't happen overnight. And just asking me is not the solution to that either. Um, to me, from our business, I believe the biggest handbrake to our business is not on-farm tech. I reckon we've got that sorted with some really good relationships with, with the tech people. That's not ideal. We need to take it further with vid a Vidivisor model. But I think the other major gap is our government and industry compliance systems. Right? That's what is the handbrake to the real efficiency of the wine industry nas nationally. I mean, we've got Dave sitting down there. He knows how I feel about it. The fact that when we have a fruit fly outbreak, you know, we bring out B-doubles and pallet loads of A4 sheets of paper where you've got to write your name and address and your property number down, you know, a hundred times. That should be instantaneous through a digital framework. Um, the same thing with the wine industry. When we're sitting in a harvester at the middle of the night, I should be able to get on my phone and have a live stream of how much Shiraz has been crushed nationwide. Why not? Why haven't we got blockchain technology in the freight of our fruit from our properties to the winery and then right through traceability to the consumer? So I think that is a huge gap. And may I be rude enough to suggest the reason that that's a gap is that probably the people trying to uh, get a commercial return on the technology see less of an opportunity in that area rather than going around and, and selling a new widget. Mm. So I, please don't take offence. <laughs> David, I'll get a couple of comments from you, then I'll come to you, Ollie. I suppose I just based on my experience with all the apps that I have and the ones that I use and don't use, for me, um, I, I guess a good example of an app that I don't use very often, that used the other night, is I've got batteries on my house and I've got a, a portal which I can monitor that on. I might have looked at three months ago. I was sitting there watching TV. I got a message on my phone. I was like, oh, it's from my batteries. I thought, what's that about? And the power had gone off. I flicked over, didn't know. Then I could get the portal up, show the kids. They could watch how much power they're using, make sure we had enough power to get through the night, all of those sort of things. But then, now I won't go to look at that app for another um, three months. But when I needed it, it let me know, notified me, and I could keep, keep an eye on it. And I suppose with a lot of my other apps, like um, basically I just had to set one up. It's controlled by web. I use that daily when I'm, I can see my pressures. I can see all the things I need, flows, if a valve's been working or not. I guess... I go to a lot of apps um, constantly, but a lot of them I don't go to that I probably would like to go to. But then I have one for my solar panels that emails me every day with a bar graph, and I can see that, okay, some of the inverters didn't work. Check them tomorrow, make sure they're working. If they're fine, and I just delete it straight away. But it's a very simple, quick visual thing, and that's how I get across those things. But the things that aren't quick and simple, I miss, mm. and, I, and sometimes I don't get on top of them. So if it could be a, a very effective form of notification that just tells you when you need to, because if you keep getting bombarded with notifications, you just ignore them all. That's the sort of app I think yeah. that, that would be utilised. Ollie, you were talking about this this morning, is you know, the integration of it, and I, uh, even um, Andy touched on it as well. Um, is it a case of too many apps doing too many different things for all, too many apps doing all the same thing? Um, I was going to... Can I add, but you know, some of the points that Brett raised. If I if I could start there, I, I would um yeah agree with so much that 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 co-design piece. Like it's the reason that like we often do our meetups in lot 14 in Adelaide, which is like the the government sort of hub for technology, and like that's a a long way 
actually off away from the farming community and we've been really conscious over the last couple of years of getting developers out and on farm and really hearing firsthand like what people like actually seeing what jobs farmers have to do and hearing firsthand from them like generally what's painful so totally agree there the best time we've ever done with platform we've had help like um tail tailors uh, up in Clare were like our co-design partners and the best time I've spent is with the grumpiest tractor driver operator in the world I sat with him in the jump seat next to him and you get to watch him trying to use he's been at that, that vineyard for 20 odd years and he doesn't want to use platform he really doesn't he thinks it's big brother on him and watching him trying to use platform and getting him like his feedback's invaluable and again we one of our like drivers is trying to get if we could ever get to a point where he feels platform is invaluable to him with one and so i totally agree that is the best time spent i would agree as well when you look at the the missing piece of the puzzle at the moment in the ag tech ecosystem in wine um if we can get some of the industry reporting tools like we we all have to link into spray diary software we've got sustainability platforms and if those platforms can be open to receive data from other sources that is going to overnight create a viable digital ecosystem and that being closed literally just is the biggest handbrake on any innovation at the moment and again tons of stuff that is also useful for developers to um like you know like simple stuff we did like just um the list of grape varieties that exist in Australia, there's like however many, 100 odd grape varieties. You, you know when you're a developer and you're like, oh, what should I go and build? Where should I go and build it? And you go and think, oh, I, I like wine. I should go and try and build something in wine. You spend weeks and weeks and weeks trying to just spin up the basic information that's needed to build something in wine. Because can you find in anywhere like the list of all the grape varieties from a kind of author like a proper author authority in a usable way for you like after months we find it's in a pdf document locked away unreadable un but again there are only little baby steps but we've we work we got wine australia to publish that on github now in an open way so we start to make it usable but i i totally agree um that's like for me from the outside the biggest step and the opportunity cost of not having a vidivisor or such single uh, digital platform is you don't have the data to benchmark yeah. so you know we've got sustainable wine making australia um again you know you've just got to go and fill out more a4 sheets of paper put your name and address and this and that and power and yeah oh my gosh you know i'm just repeating all of this whereas if you had your single digital platform where every single bit of input went into your operation for the year um at the end of the year you go through your files find your you know your SWA audit button, push it, and in you know two seconds, you know you should have an audit done. So that's a, a good example of you know the lack of benchmarking capacity because we haven't had those digital platforms. And so just in case I forget, people, everyone, there's a few people laughing because they know that when I turn up at meetings like this, <laughs> I pull out this battered copy of a document that the federal government commissioned and EY produced it in 2019. I think if you're in this space and you haven't read this and you don't understand it and you don't believe in it, get out of the tent. Because it is so obvious that, you know, agriculture has been so siloed through history, technology has been siloed through history and we've had a very, very inefficient expenditure of monies on technology and as a consequence, we have inefficient farmers, all because of siloing. Fantastic chapter in there on the case for change. It's as obvious as anything. And I think until our government departments like Persa and Saudi, et cetera, read it, understand it, and actually have policies which back it up, um, you know, we're gonna be 20 years down the track with no data to benchmark things and we'll be having the same conversation again. Is it? that the information or the, um, the data that's coming out is being held in a proprietary way rather than an open source way? Is that more the issue here? Brett's nodding, Ollie's not sure. Is that, is that the problem that it's not able to be shared? Is that the drama here? Um, I'd say that 
the you know when that that like little diagram you know the kind of storming forming norming like, like the world of the ag tech ecosystem so is definitely moving towards um a better specified data so it's kind of more interoperable like we're we're not leading the world in australia i'd agree like new zealand is get, is really super good at the moment of being really really joined up and they they basically have been working um not to try and make all of the data of agriculture in new zealand go into one single super platform um but all they're trying to do is is help all of their ecosystem just to kind of coalesce around the structure of when digital information moves, space, especially spatial digital information moves between all of all these different people in this world, they're just trying to make sure that the file format that um, that is used to move that information, everybody understands basically the structure of that file format, and and uh, and they've got like momentum because a load of really progressive people in New Zealand are adopting that file format and it's starting to work and it's only success breeds success i agree at the moment it's not there but these are all these kind of really they're not very sexy bits of work to do at all they're very dull but they're they're, they're the foundations of what you can actually build um like a house on uh yeah yeah and i think an yeah. example of um where that is required is that six of the major machinery uh, manufacturers in europe um, have decided to get there and simplify or unify their digital uh, platform. So, you know, Klaus, John Deere, etc. instead of all running their own systems, have now agreed to unify their system. So they obviously see that a critical mass of a, of a system um, is worth it. And that's the run, the risk we run as a business, is if, if we go and change the colour of our tractor, what the hell do we do for data? Peter, can I get you to jump in on here very quickly too? Can we just get a microphone down to Peter? Just uh, because you're in the research space here and, and you know there's different platforms that you would work with as well, uh, you showed the dashboard earlier. How does it all work for you? Like, do you get it all to integrate properly or is there, are there gaps in there like the... No, it's still here? quite fragmented at the moment. So um, basically Swan's probably the best one at the moment for joining things together from various uh, instruments that are on place. And that's quite uh, an admirable way to be looking at it, so that we're trying to get rid of the siloing that's going on. Some of the stuff that I like that's quite good is um, very solidly locked down on the intellectual property side of things. So that's definitely going to be uh, a hampering issue as we go down further. I think, as uh, like New Zealand's doing, that there is an undercurrent that with if we're all independent, we will all fail. So the the collaborative idea of trying to bring in underlying structure and uh, whether or not it's an overlying platform for the display of the data or an, uh, an overlying way of capturing the data that can be then um, open coded, open sourced to whoever needs it. It's, it's an evolving thing. Yep. Um, I do believe we really are at baby steps with this. Uh, it's something I've seen in uh, 20 odd years ago with the idea of things like intellectual property on germplasm. It's very similar except it's te technical information and it's very discreet stuff. It's really hard work to get to the nuts and bolts of it. It's um, something that you invest a lot of time and money into and of course you want a return on it. So uh, if you do it in isolation, yes you've got a chance you may make a return uh, if there's an uptake of your particular product. This is probably a naive way of looking at it, but it's basically a case of that we have to have a paradigm shift here where if there's can be a start to where the underlying structure is there that if you are going to do this, then there's a format to do that in and that we can share that across platforms, we will grow together. So I do believe it's, it's, it's starting to roll down the hill. We'll see where it goes. And it's, it's going to be a, a real paradigm shift away from the idea of private technical information and knowledge that's going to make you profit. It has to be a collaborative affair that we all win at some stage. I can't tell you what that product looks like yet. It's, it's an emergent thing. Um, I'm sort of right at the bottom of where I've got everybody's equipment and all their programs. So, and I'm sifting through it. And like you say, you don't want you know, another 26 apps on your phone. So, and I'm already starting to make that judgment of 
what's practical and useful for this and that and the other and maybe sometimes we need to sit down as groups and then I can run over the hurdles I have, you guys can run over the hurdles you have and we start to make that difference. Yes? Yep, question down the back there. Ben, if you could just... Um, I'm going to go against this cooperative thing. If you look at history, go back for 30 years, computers were going from buildings that size behind us to suddenly sitting on desks. And what happened to the technology? We probably had about 15 different computer brands that came out and none of them spoke to each other. So it's almost like we're in that situation now with ag tech. You know, everyone's doing bits and pieces and we're looking for collaboration. But what happened in evolution in technology is that we had things like Microsoft then became to the table and won the race and became very profitable and a very large company now. So we all use Excel. We don't use Multimate that never talked to Excel. We don't use all the other spreadsheets that were out there. The same thing happened to Apple. They nearly went broke. But then I think Microsoft chucked in $2 million, saved them, and now they're the company they are today. And they've got that ecosystem between hardware and software. And if you reflect on that, it's a fact it was business that drew, drove that. How does business work? Well, it looks at the needs of the community and looks at providing those needs and gets their wealth from that then to go on to further development. None of those government was involved in. So I suspect it's going to be a race with the technology. There might be amalgamation of technology so that they can then become more financially viable and that'll be where we'll be in about five, ten years' time. But we're not there now. Okay, interesting thoughts. And Ali, you want to respond to that? Yeah. Thanks, Mike. I think that's a really, um, a really, really good perspective and you can feel you can feel it playing out right at the moment as well. It's like the... It's the thing that's quietly happening behind the scenes. So everybody's, like, we work at this level, and then at a different level, there is this manoeuvring between um, AWS uh, and Google and Microsoft specifically, all looking at how they can basically be the lead tech company. And Hitachi actually probably a little bit, be the lead tech company when it comes to kind of world agricultural data. And... It's a really interesting, um, and, and, and people like AWS are, are very quietly everywhere. So when you're at Lot 14, which is where, where we're based, there's a load of AWS people in the Adelaide Institute of Machine Learning next door. They are everywhere. So much stuff sits on their platforms, and it's a really interesting both opportunity and challenge for agriculture and grower groups and everything. Is like, how do we um, both hopefully make some that could be a really positive relationship or that could be not a very positive relationship uh but it is happening and again on the data side there's this again the federal government with kpmg is doing a thing called the oz agritech data platform or something like that and it's like that's big consultancies with multi-million dollar budgets working with federal government looking at uh, you know like piloting loads of tech out the people that they will work with are going to be almost certainly Hitachi, Google, you know, yeah. that, that. So, yeah, it's, it's funny. Yeah, two things working in parallel at different levels of the system here in, in, in ag. And, yeah, uh, I think they will, they will come into our world a lot uh, in the next couple of years. Yeah, right. Um, I will point out lunch is just arriving, so we'll do a couple more questions if you have one. We do have one just over the side here. Yeah. Uh, me again. Ali, I've probably got a, this question is probably directed at you a bit um, in your experience in taking developers out uh, to meet producers. Um, something I've observed is this, this ideal of wanting, like having the problem and then wanting the solution and not having to deal with the steps in between. Now, something I'm observing is, is just how quickly the tech space is moving. I mean, like as a producer, you know, we've all just got our heads around what a shapefile is, and now we've, it's all evolving to JSON files. Like, how is how how can producers keep up without a translator needing to be involved in the conversation? Um, yeah. Again, yes, you're absolutely right. Like everything is um, is transitioning really quickly. Um, it's not really. I, well, I hope it will start to see it happen more here. But there definitely feels like there is a need for like. You know, you get entrepreneurs in re residence and all that thing that happens. Like, we need 
things like developers in residence in rural places. My co-founder, Lindsay, she's been a real, she works for one of the like, Mid-North RDA, and she's been really trying to, she's not yet got it over the line, but she's been really trying to push that. There's really great um, Zanes here, who's a really awesome person who, who is local, uh, just finishing high school, um, doing some really exciting work, and like just talking to him at the break, he really needs developers here in Loxton that he can engage with. Uh, and again, I, you know, you can feel it with certain farming enterprises, they're gonna need that level of resources to be able to call upon. So um, yeah, in, in a really interesting challenge, but it's not, um, yeah, that doesn't function yet at the moment. And farmers are completely at the kind of, most, you're very different hands as somebody knows this space technically very well, but most everyday farmers re really are very much at the behet, they're at the end of the chain. Uh, yeah, and it's, yeah. it'll be very easy for them to be led in a not a positive direction where they're kind of ending up getting kind of hooked and locked into a certain tech stack and all kinds of things could happen over the next couple of years. Yeah. Um, uh, ben? Yeah, way you go. So, Ollie, that's a you know, really interesting point. It's how we get from A to B. You know, that journey of actually um, the farmers that are keen to be involved in this technology not being lost. And once people get bitten and go, I've, I've sort of gone down this path, been led astray, sunk 50 grand into that, burnt it, geez, you know, and it's, it's quite hard. So I think one of the pivotal questions is how we actually take willing producers who want to be part of this to get clear, viable information. And obviously Loxton's part of that. But how do you see um, that the producer has an ability to filter that information coming through and to understand where best to hitch their wagon? Beware people's secondary agendas. That's what you get so often. Like everybody, when you start to unpick it, like has a secondary, often has a secondary objective to move you as a producer in a certain direction. And it's um, when we worked with Persa and Wine Australia and did the mapping stuff, we really purposefully built, bought on board this guy called John Bryant. And John Bryant, um, he's an open source GIS developer, one of the best in the world. And like we bought him into that project so that he was an honest broker for Platform and for, and for um, uh, Greenbrain, who we were two people. Very easily, we could have taken that project in our, own, in our own way for our own gain. Not that we would, but we had John there keeping us basically honest. And he, he runs like the Phosphor G, it's like the open mapping uh, event for the whole world. And then we had people coming and talking to us who basically run the open source, um, things like, um, like open street maps, which is the open source platform, which powers like that Google maps on your phone and stuff. We had that level of people coming to talk to us who all come from, from that open world. And yeah, uh, just at the moment, I would look, tr you know, um, and it's good with Vitivisor looking to um, publish and open source a lot of that work. If, yeah, the more we can keep things open and, and look for things that already have critical mass. So again, you'll often get pushed towards somebody's, like helping somebody build their own little widget. And if you see that happening, my, my, what I would do is, 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 and what we've done is we've looked for where is the critical mass at the moment, where's the gravity? So in mapping, that is things like open street maps, there's a mapping platform called Mapbox that tons and tons and tons of things leverage. And we, we, we think that the future of mapping in wine will leverage the mapping platforms which like power the world's streets and power the world, like everything. And we just kind of, that if we could place our bet anywhere, we'd place our bet on the things that have the most gravity, the best developer ecosystem are open and like, yeah, that, that's where we place our money. And I, and I totally can understand, like so many people won't have had yet a positive experience. Um, and we, we need to learn from that. It's really hard. But again, a lot of startups are realizing that they have, in agriculture, are realizing that they have to like build build their widgets on top of these things. It's like a paradigm shift. And again, it's sort of, you know, in that model, it's like the paradigm shift that, that has to happen. People have to go through that dip, sadly, to start to, to come out the other side. Only when you've, everything's gone wrong, isn't it, that you work out what you should do. Like, yeah, I only work out what to do. I only learn how to be a great grower by literally stuffing up everything. 
and that's the only way I've I've learned, and and it feels the same way with tech. Uh, uh, yeah, Just Andy, to quickly uh, add on to that, I think almost as a couple of take-home messages, make sure you own your own data. Uh, absolutely critical. So if we start right at the bottom of the pile, there's all this evolution in technology and software and all the rest of it, but fundamentally, make sure you own your own data. Um, and then secondly, make sure that you can use it on whatever other platform comes along. So this issue about interoperability is absolutely critical. So if you end up with a bunch of data that you do own, but it's locked into a certain service provider, well, it's not much good for you on the next platform that uh, comes along as being uh, the best since sliced bread, so to speak. So, yeah, two really critical things. Own it and make sure that you can use it cross-platform. Ben? Yeah, I think in relation to your comment, Ben, um, I've heard a lot, innovation is easier than adoption. Um, probably a bit of a pessimistic um, opinion, but probably a bit of a reality as well. Um, so I think it probably comes down to a bit of an education game and collaboration with the ag tech companies and peak bodies like ourselves and the research orchard here, um, the one um, just out at Luxon North with us, um, and start to bring growers in so that way, we, you know, it doesn't, people don't get lost in the funnel of um, losing 50 grand or something to, um, you know, something that w wasn't quite there. So I think it's not just the ag tech companies that need to be pushing it out. I think it's um, yeah, collaborative approach between industry, um, growers um, and ourselves. Excellent. Any uh, final comments from anybody before we wrap up? I know everyone's keen for lunch. All right, round of applause please for our panelists. <laughs>